Hi, my name is Mu Young Kim, and I'm a concept artist and designer, and today I'll be testing out Corel Painter. So, uh, first things first is I basically had just gotten done watching The Martian, so I was really in a nice headspace of big, wide-open spaces, and as you just saw, I'm just preparing my kind of uh, pre-selected colors and just kind of inspiration little snippets. Also, that painting right there I'm resizing was one I had done earlier, actually, in Painter, and just kind of testing out the uh, software, because quite frankly, I had not used any form of painter since before 2010 and uh, and I wanted just there to kind of get myself oriented in the right kind of space I wanted to do for this painting which was essentially something kind of inspired by the Martian which I had honestly just uh, rewatched not that long ago when I before I had done this painting so I was just really kind of thinking about uh, Martian uh, large spaces very kind of expansive almost desolate but at the same time very quiet and then even zen like kind of atmosphere that that movie had which again if you haven't seen I highly recommend it so what I uh, basically did was I found the, uh, the scratchboard tool, pen tool in Painter, and uh, I found that it just was a really nice kind of uh, hard edge palette knife style brush, and and I really do enjoy using those kind of uh, palette knife approximations just to start blocking out initial colors and tones and initial shapes. Um, in my normal kind of way, I like to think of any piece, environments or characters, in a very kind of graphic way, as a, uh, as opposed to any kind of real detail, at least at the beginning, because I just want to kind of block out the sense of uh, overall composition, shape, and quick feel on these types of things. Uh, at the same time, I also want to kind of keep in mind uh, everything's kind of divided up into four tones. So I personally think that any piece, whether environment or character, can be divided into four cardinal tones, which are uh, of a kind of a dark dark, a uh, light dark, a medium, uh, medium to dark light, and a light light. Uh, no blacks and whites, at least not initially. And if you basically kind of look at a lot of great, uh, especially Masterworks paintings, and you take them down with uh, zero saturation, just look at them tonally, you can kind of see that they're all fundamentally broken up in that way. And now whether it's from dark to light or light to dark uh, is not as important as it, as a as opposed to just the, the organization of those tones and also the general proportion of them. Now, one of the great things I liked about Painter uh, straight off was the ability to basically create custom palettes like you just uh, saw me do, which I on the bottom right, where if I like a brush or a tool, I can just literally just drag it down, put it there, leave it alone, and if I wanted to, I can actually save it off if uh, I had a specific purpose. So say you had a series of brushes that you just really like doing, say rocks, forests, uh, even you know skin texturing or rendering, you can just basically set those up pre-existing. And it's honestly, it's a really nice quality of life thing that I wish Photoshop would have, to be fair, because uh, as opposed to having to open up the brush creator or using third-person kind of uh, extensions and plugins to uh, mimic that. So it's really nice on Painter for having that baked in from the beginning. Also, another feature that it's just, again, more of a quality of life thing, but I really enjoy is the ability just to hit Control-Alt, I believe, and to just drag out the size of your brush in a very kind of analog way. Uh, honestly traditional way as opposed to having to use the very kind of binary uh, brackets uh, that Photoshop normally uses in a lot of other painting programs. Again, it's not something insurmountable, it's not something that uh, you have to have, but it's just, again, that nice little quality of life thing that helps to keep you in the painting and not pull yourself out having to deal with uh, the digital UI that I just really appreciate. So as you can see, because I knew I wanted to kind of get that sense of uh, contemplation, I really wanted to have a character in the scene fairly quickly because I knew a lot of the scene would kind of flow and focus around that. And again, uh, this, the entire point of this wasn't really to create a character design so much as a key shot, which was effectively kind of just capturing an overall sense of mood. So I didn't want to spend too much time designing the character, but I did want to make sure I had one in there, played with it, and also got a sense of the overall depth and scale with that uh, uh, sooner rather than later. So as you can see, I'm just playing around with the pose, uh, I wanted the, char the character to be facing toward the scene and thus, you know, the same direction as the audience because he is kind of the audience surrogate in this case. And again, uh, if you were kind of taking this as a uh, key shot assignment for, uh, for a film project or even a game, a lot of times you do do this because uh, you want the character in there to be part of how that entire environment or that scene is revealed to the audience or, and, or the player depending on the type of project. So here I am just kind of blocking in some tones, adding, making sure to play around with some uh, complementary things like some blues, some purples, uh, just to make sure the character has uh, a bit more color interest and also it pops off, but also playing around with the potential of adding some of the more kind of uh, orange tones that, ha uh, that is prevalent in the scenes into the character itself to make sure that the character 
fits into the scene and the world and doesn't feel that it's just kind of plopped in there and it's not integrated. So uh, basically I'm just playing around and as you can see I'm constantly flipping the canvas and I do this mainly just, it, and I highly recommend having these on uh, hotkeys, is just so you can just check to see how the composition works because again if the piece is running solidly it should work uh, flipped either way and the nice thing is it also kind of reveals a lot of errors and things like that but making your kind of eye see things in a new way. Uh, I find that also like flipping uh, on the vertical axis is a great way to check lighting and in the same way you're checking proportions. Again if, if the lighting looks right even if it's flipped upside down you, it's a pretty good indicator that your lighting is pretty solid and also more importantly pretty consistent throughout rather than uh, uh, inconsistent lighting which usually results in a lot of weird things where you realize there must be 20 different light sources or 30 different suns because of the highlights and the shadows going all over the place. So I'm just going in there right now and zooming out, zooming in, uh, kind of blocking out features, cleaning up things and starting to break up the environmental depth as it were because I want the scene to feel very vast and big and a lot of that's going to be predicated on having a really uh, strong sense of atmospheric perspective, that sense of distance, uh, because the worst thing that can happen is instead of a piece feeling like it's epically sized, that it's actually, it's just a, like something you're looking at a miniature tabletop. It's while well, the things are sized appropriately, just that sense that it's not actually that big, but it's actually just a toy. Uh, and I feel like one of the easiest ways to get around that is to make sure you've really got that tonal control and using, play, using that tool that is atmospheric depth for all its work to get it in. So you see um, I'm using a selection just to kind of, again, make sure I have nice edge control, but at the same time I can just dust it with a uh, digital airbrush uh, to just push that thing back. Um, in my normal process, I, I use the lasso tool all over the place, mainly because I think it's a great way to maintain a uh, very strong edge control, uh, but at the same time allow yourself to have a very energetic uh, uh, mark making and not, not sloppiness, but uh, Evident brush strokes because I think that adds a lot of life to a piece. Um, one of the things I remember when I first started was always feeling like, wow, I really love this sketch or this sketch painting I did. It feels so dynamic. And then once I actually started getting into it and rendering, I, I always wonder, well, where did life go from it? It just feels, starts feeling dead and stiff. And one of the things I realized was that I was once I started going in there, I would start uh, basically taking away some of that, uh, you know, control chaos of the mark making by rendering everything in the nine to, and to all to the same degree of hyper like level. And yeah, on any like little close in bit that looked great, I guess, but what it did overall was create a very stiff dead piece because everything was the same to the same level of crazy detail and noodling. And honestly, that's one of the reasons now you see, I'm actually working a lot kind of very zoomed out. Uh, or even when I zoom in uh, to do a specific, I immediately start zooming out. I've got the navigator window up on the upper right to always have a view kind of zoomed out because uh, one, on a personal level, I know that I have a tendency toward wanting to really get in there and noodle out details, really go hyper in there. But, and this is my way to combat that, but also uh, just in a general kind of rule and advice is that if it looks good zoomed out, it will it will look good zoomed in but if it only looks good zoomed in and it doesn't look that solid zoomed out then all the detail all the polish all the little like photo tricks you can do probably are not going to save it i mean i'm not going to say never will there's always those kind of uh niche cases or crazy like just hail marys that work but for the most part it's this you know out at 10 percent of you if it's not sweet then it'll never be sweet and 10% is the sweetest it will ever be and all the detailing and all the extra rendering from that point on is literally just making it so that that level of impact is maintained at the closer and closer you come in. So again, you kind of see I'm going in there dusting stuff off. I've already started kind of establishing a physiology or anatomy to the environment, which is very much canyon-esque, kind of, it's very crunchy, it's very, well, for lack of a term, it's, it's very Martian, uh, but also it's drawing a lot of... Um, inspiration from things like the Grand Canyons, uh, the Badlands, or, and basically just any kind of like uh, uh, cliff-based style desert uh, photography that I just happen to have or can find. Uh, you don't see this on this one, but I've got my on my second monitor just a load of just various uh, photography I've just got up that I just kind of was glancing at and just to keep myself oriented in the right uh, 
environmental headspace. Uh, I know, especially with character design, we always talk about the anatomy of a character, but I also feel like that is just as applicable for environment design and actually also for anything, even prop design, character, uh, and vehicle design, and things like that. Everything fundamentally has anatomy. Everything has a kind of a underlying logic and reason for the reason for the way it is and why it's structured. You, you know, clouds are the way they are because of certain rules, sunsets are, rocks break a certain way because of certain anatomical rules. And so, in my opinion, once you kind of start thinking that way, suddenly it doesn't seem so weird to uh, do environments one day, uh, characters the next, and vehicles the day after in between, because fundamentally your approach is going to be the same, uh, because it's still operating under the same kind of logical rule sets. So here I am just kind of, again, I got the character in, I put him in uh, periodically just to, again, see how it works in the composition, uh, play around with it, uh, I come up with new ideas, uh, but at the same time, I then take it out because I think for this as a key shot, um, that the piece should work obviously with the character in there, but it should also work if the character is not there because let's, let's if we're pretending that this isn't actually a keyframe kind of assignment, then yeah, the brief might have the character at, at least at some main point of the scene there like this, or potentially, you're, but that scene might start actually with the character not there, with the camera panning around, the camera zooming in or zooming out to reveal the character, and you want to make sure the environment design can handle that if at all possible. Again, first and foremost, as a concept designer, your job, in, at least in my opinion, is to create visual solutions. And so the more uh, solutions you can offer to the more uh, and address the more issues, the better that solution is fundamentally. So you see here right now, by the way, I'm deciding, hey, what if there's water here? Because that's kind of a weird twist on a Martian landscape. Water, something that we know doesn't exist in at least an unfrozen abundance there. Uh, and the also waterways also work two very important things for these kind of large scale pieces. One, it adds a great compositional flow to everything because you can really help direct the eye and the focal point. And two, it is a great way to communicate that sense of vast scale because if you see water up close, obviously you're going to see a lot of the ripples, a lot of that kind of stuff. But far away, it is just almost a mirror sheet, a reflection of the sky and the light. And so it's just a great little tool to help reinforce that. So you see here right now, I've literally brought in one of those reference photos I was talking about because I wanted to start uh, introducing some nice photo elements into it, which is something I use all the time in my process. It's, it's a very normal Thing, and I honestly find it to be a great time saver and also it just sometimes you get these great little happy accidents that you wouldn't get even from just you know random mark making uh, and I was very curious to see how painter allowed it allowed me to do uh, uh, this kind of stuff because uh, painter at least back in the day its transformation tools were not as robust as I would have wanted and so it made kind of using these photograph photographic elements a lot more um, roundabout than say something like Photoshop and I'm really happy to see now that the that how much more powerful and robust the transformation tools are now in Painter because I found it very easy to just basically grab a photo make a selection dump it in and then start playing with it and uh, it's just I, it's not that you have to do that in painting but it has become such kind of a staple part of uh, the professional pipeline in the entertainment industry that uh, a program that doesn't uh, that doesn't have it will always be very kind of jarring and but and programs that do have it uh, will always be kind of something that professionals will gravitate toward more. Uh, furthermore, it was really cool to see because Painter R is already well known for something uh, for having that very strong emphasis on that painterly not just look but also the kind of feedback because it always feels like the brush is when I'm using them are scraping against something like canvas which is really cool. I don't know if there's some kind of physics in there or whatever, but it always does feel like I'm actually kind of putting some kind of physical thing on another physical thing, which I really dig. But seeing it also having this kind of uh, ability to now do also the more, for lack of a term, kind of digitally thing, which was adding the photos and playing around with it is just, it's, it's great. Um, and also made it so it was a lot easier for me just to take what I, my normal approach and just go use it as is in Painter with relatively little modification. I mean, honestly, the biggest things I had to kind of uh, adapt to was just the fact that 
Painter uh, obviously will treat different uh, tools in a slightly different way, or even just labeling, just learning the new nomenclature, or even the keystrokes for that. And again, that's something that's very easy to do because that just means you go in there and you play with the program for a little bit. You open up every little thing, you open up every little dialog box, so you just try every little button, and that's just how you get comfortable with programs. Uh, as you can see, so again, I'm using a selection to kind of paint in more areas, and I'm a big believer in that you never drop a photo into a piece and just leave it, but then you start playing with it. You play with the tonal controls, you play with the, the brightness, saturations, the contrast, every little thing, and then you start painting on it because if you just dump it in, I feel that it's very, you can, it's almost always easy to tell what the photo element is versus the not photo element. But when you, if you treat it more like a very specific and highly complicated brush and then play with it and integrate it, then you always make sure that the photo never has higher levels of like detailed density, for instance, than the rest of the painting. And certainly, you know, you don't want the peripheral or background areas to have a higher level of detail and this eye catchingness than your focal points. Uh, that being said, you know, the use of photos is so powerful because immediately, you know, you take these kind of silhouetted blobs, you put it, and then you start giving them uh, a sense of detail to and a grounded feel to it, which it just, again, it saves time. It's, it adds a lot of a uh, very quick authenticity to a uh, piece of what is, can be a very fantastical thing, but gets that sense of kind of grounding in some form of recognizable reality. Again, it's like, I'm a firm believer that you're not as a concept artist or even as an artist you're not you're not main purpose is to create just a strict photo but it's to really think about it and then replicate how the human mind and eye perceives visuals and then use those kind of heuristics and tricks to create your a compelling image um, so, you know, if you think about in animation terms, for instance, animators will always say that you have to exaggerate your animations to make them feel right. Well, I feel like that's the same thing in uh, painting and concept design. You, you, start, you start with a very strong grounding fundamentals and fundamentals and in reality, but then you learn why those things work the way they are. And then that way, you know what you can exaggerate and push to give that extra little kind of zazz and magic that turns even like what is effectively kind of a normal idea, which is just this vista into something that feels compelling and eye-catching. And if you're really, you know, on top of things you, and you get the, and you can create that wow moment on, on a very kind of quiet thing, you've got aces there. You know you're doing your job and you're doing it well. So again, I'm just kind of going in there right now and playing around, cleaning up with stuff, uh, cleaning up areas, uh, pushing back elements, uh, using the airbrush and also bringing stuff forward. Uh, here I am using some photography from NASA. And I will, by the way, highly recommend that uh, if you haven't looked at, uh, at, Na at the NASA release photos, especially of things from like the Curiosity missions and the Mars rovers and things like that, please do so. They are a absolute wealth of both reference images and just pure inspiration. I mean, these are incredibly high detail, high quality imagery of places that are not the Earth. And chances are you and I will never get to visit. I mean, if you get to go visit Mars, I am incredibly jealous because, wow. But for the most part, I can, you know, generally assume none of us will get to go there, at least anytime soon. But these imageries, let's, uh, these images and this imagery lets us go, you know, the next best thing, which is see what it's like. And, you know, that's something awesome to wrap your head around that we have all these great photos of places outside of Earth, other planets in our own solar system. So here I am taking another bit of him that has a high level of kind of uh, greeblies and crunchiness and details. And I realized that would be great for the foreground rock that my space dude is sitting on or uh, standing on, I should say, who later on will soon be sitting on. Because it just, again, it has that great amount of detail density for a foreground part. And as opposed to a distance piece uh, like the rest of it, where I don't want a lot of detail. I don't want a lot of gribbly because, again, the more little details you see, the more it's going to make it feel less like a distant, vast vista and more like a very well-built but ultimately tiny miniature on a table. So there, I'm just kind of cleaning things up, playing around with the shapes, uh, feeling like uh, and integrating. Uh, I'm making more selections. Uh, you're going to see me do that a lot because, again, I use selection painting a lot in my normal process. And, and you know, it's something I can just easily do in Painter. If you want to think of it in a terms of how you would have done that in a traditional painting, like an oil, well, or an watercolor, that is analogous to just basically taking masking tape and masking areas out, obviously. Again, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a great way to both allow yourself uh, a very strong set of edge control, 
but at the same time uh, give you nice freedom making big large strokes using big large brushes and trying to maintain the energy that using those kinds of techniques uh, just inherently has. So here I'm just kind of again dusting more stuff, adding some highlights, uh, re helping um, reinforce that horizon line in the perspective, uh, adding a little bit more water. Uh, again, just trying to imagine while the sun is obviously very uh, small and not super strong in the sky because uh, it is a you know it is a Martian landscape, that it's still going to be kind of being much more reflective and specular, especially on things like water. And, you know, pushing things a little bit more than maybe they would be in, in strictly in reality on Mars. For, again, for the sake of the composition and because, again, it's not necessarily, it's not breaking the rules, but it is pushing them. And, again, it's that exaggeration I was talking about earlier. Uh, again, here I am uh, basically deciding, hey, you know, that far distant line of cliffs and mountains, not just not interesting enough. It needs a little bit more. So, again, just doing some quick selection shapes, painting in some of that color of the background, and then dusting it with an airbrush just to kind of help push things away. And then here I am just kind of cleaning things up a little bit, uh, thinking, okay, that needs to be a little bit taller there. Or, you know, in the case of this, like I, I tried and decided it's not working. So I just paint it out or paint it a little different, differently. And I, that kind of brings up another thing, which I think is the fundamental real strength of digital over other forms of media, uh, is that it is just so endlessly editable and forgiving. There is like, no reason not to try something in on a digital painting, uh, you know, time permitting, because if it doesn't work, you can always just turn it off. But if it does work, wow, you, sometimes the best things I've gotten are because of just, hey, just trying something out and thinking maybe, maybe not, and it ended up working. Uh, and it's not like an oil painting where if I do a mark or do a set of colors or glazing and it just doesn't work fundamentally, I'm going to have myself a little cry because I have to wait a little bit, then scrape it all off, and I may have just lost hours, if not day, uh, days of like work on there, and you know, and how much in just the paint itself costs. Digitally, it's like worst thing is like, oh cool, uh, I lost maybe thirty seconds doing that. So again, it, it's digital really allows you to not be that precious about anything, and it is a medium where it is so conducive to just killing your darlings. If it's not working, just go with something different. And if you don't know, try it anyway, because it is just literally one control, undo away if it doesn't. Or you get these really great happy accidents, and it leads you to places that you may never have gone, uh, could have gone in a conscious manner, because you just wouldn't have thought of it that way, or you just weren't necessarily in the right headspace at the time to have come up with that solution. So again, here I am just basically putting more in the foreground and using the same kind of handful of photos. Um, yeah, if you, by the way, if you haven't like picked up photography, I highly recommend it. Uh, obviously, things like, you know, Google searches and the internet allows us access to just a plethora of imagery. But in the end of the day, like if you can take your own photography, that's even better because then you can take the photos that you know will work for you. And if nothing else, uh, kind of just the um, knowledge of photography in general will really at least for me, really helped out kind of learning how to compose shots, to kind of design for shots, uh, to design scenes uh, that are more useful, uh, especially in, say, film work, where in the end of the day, someone does have to sit down there and think of, like, oh, what's the millimeter of the lens, the camera, what kind of camera, how are we going to, like, compose the shot? And if you know how that's done already, then you can kind of design with that in mind. And not to say that you should let that constrict you, uh, especially on these early phase, uh, this early step of just kind of busting out the initial ideas, but it's not never a bad thing to have in the back of your head. And honestly, yeah, you know, people on other people on the production pipeline are gonna thank you for that. And if you work uh, primarily with CG stuff or in gaming, that knowledge of photography and camera work in general is also gonna be very useful because you know while they're not physical, there's games still use cameras. They still use camera work. They still talk about foley. You're still talking about focus links, you're still talking about focus, you're still talking about diameters and things like that. And there are certain like uh, lens diameters that work for different types of moods and storytelling uh, elements. So here basically you just saw got one of my old, like uh, just reference photos of some space suit costume. And I'm basically just throwing that in there real quick because I wanted just to add a little tooth to it. Again, this, I'm, handling, I'm approaching this more like this with a keyframe, so I'm not really wanting to spend that much time designing the costume as it were. I just want to have a person situated in the scene and just enough 
of the person of that character rent, uh, figured out and put in there to fit in the scene to kind of sell the thing and not to take people out of it but not so much as to say yes this is the actual character design and things like that because if I was doing the character design I would all obviously do that in a, diff in a different manner in a different sheet and not have you know be much more um, enunciated as it were with the design you know there wouldn't be these deep shadows and things like that hiding the design because that that then that's design elements that the person who actually either has to physically make if there's a costume or create it in 3D would then ha not know is there and have to ask me about later and that's just you know that's just making more work uh, that is and more delays in the pipeline than is necessary and that you should honestly know better than to do. So one of the things you noticed is also that I had changed the pose of the character from being you know, this more kind of heroic standing gazing off in the distance into the kind of sit down legs kind of huddled up arms across because again I wanted the sense of uh, taking five minutes time to s step back and just view things it's kind of like one of those quiet moments in this of like in between maybe the you know if this was a film in between major set pieces or story moments where they're just letting both the character in story but also the audience outside of it take kind of a breather to reset themselves kind of take it all in digest what has happened and also get them set up and ready uh, for what the next part of the story, or if it, or in the game, the next part of the experience is to entail. So again, here I am just kind of adding some more colors, using selections, um, and making sure that there's enough of the kind of overall reddish orange of the environment in the character to make sure that they feel situated in the world, while at the same time having enough kind of uh, contrary colors and things like that, so that there's a little bit more pop, so they just don't disappear in the rocks. So here I am again. I'm feeling like that that entire mid-ground area is just way too close to the character. It feels like it's the, the distance separation is not enough. So I just did, a, again, quick selection, dusted that with an airbrush, and just started pushing it back. Uh, and again, constantly zooming in to just do little things, but then spending a lot of my time zoomed out to make sure that is it working as a whole? Because, um, again, it, you know, if this was an actual kind of production assignment, I would basically be doing, you know, four, five, six of these a day. And I don't want to spend too much time on any one of them. I just want to get enough there that it gets it communicates the idea, solves the problem, and then you know at the end of the day, then present these up to either my client, my art director, my lead, and basically say, hey, here are my here are my solutions to the challenge of the design, and see which one sticks. Because yeah, I could have spent all that time making just like the sweetest book cover level illustration, as it were, but you know, at the end of the day, if I only have one solution to offer, and that's not the right solution, when I could have spent that same amount of time making five solutions that could have worked, uh, you know, that's that's not right on me. It's, you know, my, again, your job, my job, is to create uh, solutions, to come up with answers to problems, and to give options. So it just it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend too much time on any one thing at the expense of creating uh, multiple potential uh, ven uh, solutions. Because then after that, you can get your feedback cycle, you can do the adjustments that are necessary, or if they say, hey, that's it, then you can get the time to like really just take it up to that next level of detail they need for either like a set, p a set uh, piece, establishing shot, keyframe, whatever. So here I am, and I've kind of decided, yeah, cool, you know, this is a good spot. Uh, now I'm going to sign it with my, you know, little crazy little glyph, which is just my name in Korean, honestly. And what I like to think, it kind of looks like a silly little robot face. It's just me. I, I swear, like, I come up with a new way to chain, uh, sign my name every four, you know, two, four years anyway, just because, yeah, whatever. But, and I'm just kind of going through looking at it. It's like, okay, there, that little piece. I want to clean a little bit on the helmet. Um, and then just kind of looking at it and just saying, hey, you know what? That works for me. I'm flipping around just to try to check because uh, I wanted to see what worked. Okay, so now here I've skipped ahead a little bit and I've done a little bit more on it, just you know here and there, because I just wanted to show you guys where it could go. And honestly, I wanted to keep the the bulk of the actual uh, video to be about an hour and a half at longest, so that when it was sped up, it was only about three times speed, because I always feel like any longer than that, and it's honestly very hard as a viewer to see what's happening. So. Yeah, it just kind of, you know, keep it limited like that. And I'll, honestly, I kind of approach this more as creating a nice speed painting or uh, establishing shot kind of initial ideation. So here it is where I did a little bit more to it, added some more stuff. And in this case, I was just kind of bringing out the colors, making it a little richer, making it brighter, uh, changing the mood, and also doing more with that character concept. Because honestly, I love space suits. I love sci-fi. So I'm like, I want to do more on that anyway. 
and adding what I am calling his lunchbox, <laughs> it, you know, to the side because hey, maybe this is where he goes to lunch, right? So anyway, overall, I really enjoyed doing this. Uh, Painter is really great, and honestly, I wanted to just thank ArtStation Painter for giving me this opportunity. I hope you guys enjoyed this as well. So thank you, and bye.